celebrating 41 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, it's the first show of our 41st season. And guess what? You're not the only one who's hot, your animals are too. We'll talk with an expert who will give us some pointers on the proper way to shade cattle on these hot summer days. And the Food Factor steps outside the kitchen to speak with a nutritionist about what you can do to eat well and live healthy. Plus, here's one way to get by, deadheading. See what it takes to make your plants bloom longer and keep a healthy garden. Talk about a hole in one, we'll bring you the story of a livestock farm turned golf course. Hear how the farmer behind the idea made his vision a reality. A brand new season of Farm Week starts right now. Leighton Span. And I'm Troy Mullink. Thanks for joining us today here on Farm Week. First show of our 41st season, Leighton. How about that? And wow. of course, we want to thank everybody for all their support all these years. Let's get this 41st season started off. Great idea. And Troy, why don't you get us started? Of course, keeping the herds cool in the hot summer weather, that's something at the forefront of many farmers' minds this time of year. Uh, you got that right. To shade or not to shade, that is the question when it comes to keeping cattle cool in the summertime sun. And the more time cattle spend in the shade, the less time they spend grazing, growing, and producing milk. Well, we spoke with an expert to get his advice on how farmers can handle this hotly debated topic. It's a burning question among producers and animal science researchers. Keep your cattle in the sun and grazing or keep them cool under the shade. Well, that is true. So the more time they spend in the shade trying to cool off, then that affects grazing time. Uh, and of course, uh, forages, doesn't, they don't grow very well up under a tree. So uh, most of the time, if they are uh, in the shade, then they're going to spend less time grazing. And so they spend more time and energy trying to stay cool instead of maybe growing or milking for the, that young calf. Smith says studies show cattle can begin to exhibit heat stress at 73 to 76 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the breed. That's why many farmers opt to provide plenty of shade and water and let the cattle figure it out. They'll start pretty much grazing during the coolest time of the day, and I've seen it in situations where they actually graze at night. Producers can buy portable shading units, but if they aren't moved often, it can result in a messy situation. The only thing you got to be careful of with that is if you leave it in one place for a long period of time, then where animals defecate and urinate, it will basically make a muddy place. Um, and also, just from hoof traffic will pretty much kill the forage that's pretty much in that area. It's just heavy traffic. But um, the best thing, of course, is just a, a, a tree that you know, the good Lord has given us. Some of Dr. Smith's current research includes studying cattle hair length as it relates to heat stress and if animals that shed quicker can perform at a higher level and wean a heavier calf. While the Food Factor usually discusses ways to make your diet healthier, that's only one step to having a well-rounded lifestyle. In this week's segment, MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes introduces us to Dr. Brent Fountain for a discussion on why exercise and healthy eating should go hand in hand. Hi everybody, welcome to The Food Factor. As you can see, we're out of the kitchen today to discuss something that goes hand in hand with healthy eating, and that's exercise. With us today, we have Dr. Brent Fountain, Extension Nutrition Specialist. Thanks for coming today, Brent. Thanks for having me, Natasha. So how does healthy eating and exercise go together? Well, they both go well together. You think about it, you need to have fuel for your activities, and our fuel is food. Imagine you have an expensive sports car. You're probably not going to put inexpensive gas in that sports car. Uh, our bodies work much the same way. It's the most precious thing we have, and we only have one. So doesn't it make sense that you would want to put the best food available in your body? 
Definitely. I'm not putting inexpensive gas in my car. <laughs> what are some specific ways that eating healthy can energize my workout? Because you know I need energy. We all need energy when we work out. And you think about it, it's going to really depend on the activity. We certainly want to start with a good, uh, healthy food in the beginning. That way we'll have enough energy for our activity. Sometimes we may need energy in between our activities. Um, most of the time we could probably just use water. And of course in the end we want to repair and replenish what we lost. And so a good source of protein, maybe some carbohydrate and long-term activities will help us do that. But it'll make sure that we're ready to go again the very next day. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, Brent. And the good news is, is he'll be coming back from time to time. And remember, it's time to make healthy food and exercise a factor, factor in, in your, your life. life. As Natasha said, look for Dr. Brent Fountain in future episodes of The Food Factor for tips on combining a healthy diet with exercise. We look forward to his expertise. Long-lasting color makes for one happy gardener. And in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman tells us about the importance of deadheading. phrase, I'm all about easy when it comes to maintaining the landscape, especially in the summer season. But this time of year, there's one garden chore that helps to keep many flowering plants looking good that often gets overlooked. Despite its name, deadheading is good for your flowering plants. Deadheading extends the bloom period, maintains the health of garden plants, and removes the seed source of beautiful flowering plants that have the potential of becoming a weedy mess for years to come. The normal life cycle of plants has the primary goal of producing seed for the continuation of the species. And if we interrupt this cycle, the plants will try again to complete their genetic programming. Deadheading many flowering summer plants, both annuals and perennials, encourages the plants to restart their bloom cycle. Deadheading is really pretty simple, so don't be afraid. Simply select a flower head that is past its prime and snip it off. Also, collecting nice looking flowering stems for indoor arrangements is another form of deadheading. Deadheading is also needed for plants grown for their foliage, like the sun-loving coleus. Removing the non-showy flowers allows the colorful foliage to be the focus. There are a couple of techniques the home gardener can use when deadheading. Soft stems can simply be pinched off. Or you can use bypass pruners for a nice clean scissors cut. True deadheaders will put on headphones while getting to work in the garden to create a little American beauty of their own. I'm horticulturist Gary Garcia Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. So Gary says the colors may not match the tie-dye t-shirt you're always wearing, but deadheading will help keep your garden uh, last longer and a uh, deeper color into that growing season. And, you know, we kind of had that Grateful Dead theme with that package because of the deadheading. Yeah. You toured with uh, the Grateful Dead for a few years, didn't you, Layton? Oh, you got it. You got it right yeah, there. You, you, right and, there. you and Jerry Garcia like this. <laughs> That's right. We were, we were always out there getting into trouble. Oh, I know you were. <laughs> uh, any trouble in the markets today? Well, let's see what kind of trouble we can get into. And we do have breaking news I want to tell you about. California announced it is adding glyphosate, in other words, Roundup, to that state's list of chemicals that cause cancer. And also in Arkansas, State Plant Board there has voted to stop the sales and use of the herbicide dicamba due to suspected damage to soybeans and other crops. We'll have more on these stories in the coming weeks. Meanwhile, a few more cattle than expected show up in the on-feed report. Despite Cindy's rain, there may still be a decline ahead for cotton. And corn prices could face a tough road, but there may be a wild card. The monthly cattle on feed report features higher numbers across the board. Placements continue to outpace last year. The USDA says placements of cattle into feedlots were up 12% from a year ago. Fed cattle marketings were 9% higher. And the total number of cattle on feed was up 3%. Well, processors are cranking out more pounds of farm-raised catfish these days. Another new report, one out last week, shows that U.S. farm sales were up 26% in May. 
The average price paid to producers was $1.16 per pound for the premium size live fish. Processor sales were up just over 10% for the month compared to the same time one year ago. Well, U.S. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue, he's in China this weekend. He's there for the official reintroduction of U.S. beef to that huge market. At the same time, farmers here remain concerned about the White House position on selling ag products to Cuba. American Farm Bureau President Zippy Duval said in Starkville last week he remains optimistic that it will work out. We think that we're going to be able to move forward and still be able to trade agricultural products there. It's important to our farmers. It's important to that country. And, uh, and I know uh, Governor Sonny Perdue, I actually visited Cuba with Governor Sonny Perdue, who is now Secretary Perdue. And I know that he understands the importance of agricultural products going into Cuba. And he's sitting in that cabinet room, and I know he's going to carry that heavy voice with him. Time now for our trivia quiz, so let's take a look. What year was National Catfish Day first observed? Perhaps you missed it. It was just a few days ago, June 25th. Is the answer A, 1978, B, 1987, C, 1999, or D, 2009? We'll have the answer coming up a bit later on Farm Week. We're going to pause for a short break, but don't go anywhere. Still ahead, the cotton market has seen better days. Brian Williams is here to give us the latest. And today's feature is a really fun story. Grab the nine iron because we're going golfing. But before people were teeing off here, it used to be a farm. We'll talk with the guy who had the idea to turn the farm into a fairway. Stay with us. There are some moments in life where everything seems to be just right. Time slows down and memories are made that will last a lifetime. That is, unless you've got fire ants. Then those memories can quickly turn into nightmares. It's time to bite back, Mississippi. Learn how to make your yard a safe place to play again at msucares.com slash bite back. Are you friends with Farm Week on Facebook? If not, you're missing out. Here at Farm Week, we want to hear from you. Got a question about agriculture? Our experts can help. Have a picture to share? We'd love to see it. And there's even a chance it could show up on a future episode. So like us today and join in on the conversation. And you're going to love this upcoming event. Check it out in this week's Extension Spotlight. Tom Petty said it best. You belong among the wildflowers. If that sounds like you, then head on over to the Coastal Plain Branch Experiment Station in Newton, Mississippi for the second annual Wildflower Field Day. It all happens on July 13th. The event will include morning presentations on native wildflower management, habitats, and production. That'll be followed by a free lunch and an afternoon field tour with education from Mississippi State Extension. The day is sponsored by Keep Mississippi Beautiful, and is part of the Wildflower Trails of Mississippi program. Seating is limited, so you'll have to register by July 7th. Email Neely Norman at the address on your screen. And that's this week's Extension Spotlight. Well, the cotton crop needs some extended warm, dry weather following Tropical Storm Cindy's recent rainfall. The cotton market, meanwhile, is fearful of price decline. Extension's Brian Williams brings us up to date. Brian, could all the moisture we got across the belt from Tropical Storm Cindy, could that impact prices at all? Well, there's some potential there. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind with that is that most of our crop, I think about 98% of our crop is actually in the ground already. Uh, so as far as the planting progress, it's not going to have too much of an impact. But this storm is really pretty widespread, um, reaching from Texas all the way to Georgia, which is really cotton country. So the big question is how much cotton is it going to flood out? How much is it going to stunt the growth or, or hurt the growth of the, the cotton? Well, up until this system, it seemed like the weather pretty much had been cooperating as far as generating the increased, uh, you know, situation it, as far as supplies. It had. And, and when we look at the planting progress, we're basically done planting our cotton. And the weather was real cooperative in, in terms of getting that crop in the ground. So it looks like probably we're actually going to hit that 
hit those those high acres that they were projecting. Um, but the, the question is, what's the weather going to do from now on out? Well, backing up a little ways, the June supply demand report, that, that kind of was a hit to the cotton market, wasn't it? It did, and a lot of it was um, demand-driven. They're, they're a little bit hesitant, um, same way with, with our other crops. They're hesitant to make any moves on the acreage or production until later in the season, but exports seem to hit it, take a hit in, in this uh, report with both old crop and new crop exports. They weren't as high as what we were hoping. So hope kind of diminished a little bit as far as what, what was assumed might be a good, good point. It did, uh, and I think we may see these numbers bumped up in, in future reports. Um, looking at the actual numbers on the old crops, um, our exports have actually outpaced or already beat the numbers that they put, got in this estimate, so it, they almost have to move it up in this next, next report. So as we begin the month of July, what's the outlook in your mind as far as cotton market? I would say probably neutral to bearish, um, given the large crop that, we've, that we're expecting, and right now indications are that we're heading down that road. Um, so with that taken in mind, even with steady demand, it's, it's not, uh, there's not a lot of upside to the cotton markets. Meanwhile, in the corn market, futures are trading two and a half to three cents higher in the front months after the USDA showed little improvement in U.S. crop conditions. In last Monday's weekly report, trader Ted Seifert says the wheat trade could also be a key to corn's future. If we can get wheat to rally, that'll really help corn. Um, it might not be the only thing we need, you know? I mean, if we have a, listen, if we have a perfect growing season and we end up with a 178 national average yield, it's going to be tough to really get corn to rally and sustain a rally. Uh, but you look at the growing season that we've had so far, I'm going to argue that while it's not impossible to hit those numbers, uh, I, I think at this point it's starting to get very unlikely. Uh, I think minimally we're going to shot to 421 in December corn. I'm starting to wonder if it's going to be closer to 440. At our production time this week, July corn was 359, December was 377. Back to trivia now to give you the answer and wrap up the markets. Our answer is B, National Catfish Day, first observed 1987. Our feature story this week takes us to a golf course. It's not just any golf course, however. You see, it's located on a farm. And there are only three greens, not the usual nine or 18. But as Farm Week's Jonathan Parrish shows us, the uniqueness of this course is what makes it so special to a lot of people. Down an unassuming road between Jackson and Vicksburg, Mississippi, there is a place. A place that at first glance makes people announce out loud with bewilderment. That's a golf course. Yes, it is a golf course. More specifically, it's the Halifax Holes. You won't find Halifax Holes listed in any golf magazines as one of the top places to play in the state. And a quick search of the internet doesn't reveal much information either. But make no mistake, this is a special place to many people. Halifax Holes is the brainchild of Ted Kendall III. Kendall is the former president of Gaddis Farms, a position his son Ted Kendall IV now has. Gaddis Farms is a 20,000 acre operation and produces livestock, cotton, soybeans, and corn. The area of the farm where the golf course sits was once a mule lot. The mules were used by employees of Gaddis Farms to herd livestock and perform various other jobs. As technology advanced and the mules were phased out, Ted Kendall didn't necessarily know what he would do with the now vacant land. And then one Sunday in the late 60s, Kendall went to play golf with his wife, and a passion for a game he had never played before was born. Uh, after a few years of marriage, and she was still trying to play one Sunday afternoon. She asked me to go play golf with her, and I said, well, I'll go, but I'm not going to hit a ball, and I'd rather be napping. And, on the first tee, I said, let me, let me try to hit one. And I, I hit a ball and we never found it. And, uh, but from that day, I, I got the bug. I never was any good. I took lessons. I hid clubs in the back of my pickup truck and, and would go sneak around and take a lesson here, there, and yonder, but it, it never did much good. Although Ted Kendall's passion for the game grew, it was still quite a leap to go from just beginning a sport to building your own golf course. It's a leap Dennis Mason, 
an employee of Gaddis Farms for over 50 years, remembers well. Look, it was a strange thing. I think, Mr. Ted, what happened back years ago is in 70 or 69, between 69 and 70, he went to Raymond one Sunday afternoon. He was going to play golf, and he couldn't hardly get out there. And it took him five or six hours to play 18 holes. When he came home, he decided, you know, I believe I'll get my own golf course and I can play when I want to, <laughs> you know. And I think that's how it all got started, you know, back years ago. With a firm vision in place for what would now go on the former mule lot, Kendall and his neighbor began designing and building the course. But it wasn't long before they ran into a problem. The course just wasn't long enough to hit long irons and drivers. As soon as we got it, got them built, we realized we needed to be able to hit a long ball. So we looked across the road and we were mowing a pretty good yard over there. And uh, so we went over and built a green right in front of that house. But that was, that was the beginning. In 1970, the course opened for play. There were three greens and the course measured around 4,400 yards, with a county road going through the middle of the course. It quickly became a unique hangout spot and afforded employees of Gaddis Farms and others in the area the opportunity to be introduced to a game they may have never otherwise played. You know, there's a lot of people who would be just like me. I mean, I couldn't afford to go to a country club, join a country club and play. Uh, if it hadn't been for this golf course, I probably wouldn't be playing, I never would have played golf. And I'm just one of the many that has, he has helped. Of course, the newly built Halifax holes needed maintenance and upkeep. Ted Kendall turned to Mississippi State University for advice and answers to his questions. A plan was put into place and some used equipment was rounded up. Current Gaddis Farms employees were given responsibilities as far as the upkeep of the course. You know, we just, we get it done with, with the help that does a lot of other things. There's no full-time golf course person. We call on all volunteers of all kinds, Dennis and Robert Mason and, uh, and a lot of other folks to, uh, to help get it done. It takes one person about two days a week to keep the fairways and greens cut but the maintenance of the course is constant. Keeping greens and fairway mowers in working order is a big part of the course upkeep. As Dennis Mason says, there is always something to do to the golf course. I have put sod, laid sod, and uh, green, you know, fertilizer greens, and punch of greens, and all of that good stuff, you know, that people don't really know anything about <laughs> except us, you know, but, uh, it's a, it's a good bit of work goes in to a golf course to make it look like this one. Back in the year 2000, after its first 30 years, the Halifax Holes course needed a remodel. Equipment had gotten better and golfers had gotten stronger. The course wasn't long enough and it became apparent after a few close calls and a few broken windshields that a county road no longer needed to be in the middle of the course. I hit a ball one day that bounced short and danced up in a dump truck and went on down the road. I mean, and uh, and and we had we hit a few cars, but they were mostly neighbors and friends, so we never had any problem. And but we did finally get it shut down. The decision was made to clear trees, extend the course, and add another green. The change increased the yardage of the three green course to over 5,700 yards. There are two par fives that measure over 500 yards each. However, the changes to the course weren't universally loved. A lot, of the, a lot of the golfers out here who had played the old course for so long, they got kind of upset because they said, we ruined it, we made it too hard. But it became more like a golf course. It became apparent early on that the course could be used to help some local organizations in the area by hosting benefit tournaments. Halifax Holes is now the site of tournaments benefiting the Boy Scouts, a local private school, Hines Community College, and Clinton's high school baseball team, among many others. In 2016, it's estimated the various tournaments raised over $26,000 for the organizations. As the course has evolved over the years, there is another Kendall getting into the game of golf, and specifically into the golf course. Mr. Ted's grandson, Whit Kendall, moved into the house across the road. 
revamped the old green the course once used and turned it into a practice area. Witt says he is happy with the decision his grandfather made years ago to put a golf course on part of the farmland. It's just unique because, I mean, if you look at it compared to the other ground, if you just put a fence up around it and, you know, let cattle on, I mean, it would look just like, you know, the rest of the farm within a couple of months. So it's just unique that that's kind of what he wanted to do with this piece of ground. And I just think it's awesome that it's just carried on through the years. And it's definitely something that I want to keep the tradition going. And it does raise a lot of money for other people. And I mean, I've had tons of good memories out here. I know other people have too, so it's just a lot of fun. One of the many unique things about the Halifax Holes is when they have a tournament, it truly is a shotgun start. <laughs> and they're off. From the best kept secret in golf, I'm Jonathan Parrish reporting. What a neat story. That was a lot of fun. I know you love golf. Maybe load up the clubs, go play around out there. Yeah, I need to do that. Beautiful course for mm -hmm. sure. Well, next week we're going to have a very special episode all about food. You'll meet one farmer in Mississippi growing a different type of crop. Find out how incorporating turmeric into your diet can make a big difference. Oh yeah, and have you ever wondered what a food scientist does? We'll have the answer and hear the research that's being done to keep your family and your community healthy. And finally, this woman is using sustainable agriculture to provide healthy food options for her friends and neighbors. See how farming the right commodities is growing her customer network every day. Thanks so much for joining us this week, our first show of the 41st season. I'm Troy Moling. And I'm Leighton Spann. See you next time.